So I've been asked to talk about what we have been doing at Tideway from a, a case study. So I'll, I'll very briefly go through what the project is, the structure of the project, uh, and, and then we'll start looking at some of the key decisions around our BIM story and go through where we are now and start to describe some of the enablers that we see there to support the level two implementation along with some challenges that we have ourselves. So the actual project itself is you, this is London, but you wouldn't necessarily recognize this because this is London back in the 18th century where we had a number of rivers. And those rivers don't exist anymore. They're, talk, they're talked about as the lost rivers because those rivers really became what was our sewage network. Everyone just chucked things in the river and it went straight into the River Thames. And we had some problems in the uh, 18th century in that we had three major cholera outbreaks in the early 1800s. And also from the point of view in 1858, there was something called the Great Stink, which was when actually Parliament was suspended due to just the, how terrible the conditions were. So Joseph Bazalgette created this interceptor sewer, a feat of engineering from the Victorian age, which was really to, to exactly do that, intercept the sewage from the point of view of rather than going straight into the River Thames, what they would do is intercept it and then move it to the east of London. Not necessarily to treat it, but just to get rid of it out of London, etc. So we've, we've moved on somewhat from there as such. So, so, you know, when he designed it in 1860, at that time the population was 2 million. You know, there, there was lots of green spaces. They didn't really use water as much. I mean, they used water if they were lucky at all to, to maybe to drink, but not necessarily to wash as such. So he designed it with this idea of four million cap capability. So Great Victorian, it lasted 50 years. You know, we're now at 8.6 million. Uh, so we're well beyond that capacity. And this is a combined <coughs> sewer. So really the way that interception works is we don't have separate sewers for our water and waste, it's combined. So everything goes into that. So when it was designed and when it rained, maybe two times a year it would end up in the River Thames. We're now in a position where 50 times a year, and it's equivalent of 62 million cubic metres of sewage, go straight into the River Thames, which is just not acceptable from an environmental and, and from a European directive sort of coming through. So we needed to deal with that, and we needed to deal with this idea of, of how we could build that infrastructure to last for the next 100 years. Looking at options to actually completely start from fresh, 60, million, 60 billion, just not practical. So what we did was we came up with the Thames Tideway Tunnel itself, which was to really create a new sewage tunnel running along the River Thames, primarily because, A, it's easy to avoid a lot of the existing infrastructure, but also there were, that's where those actual sites were, where they went into the River Thames. Uh, so what we were doing, we were actually intercepting the interception uh, sewers as such, and, and it's a seven-year project, 4.2 billion in value, and 24 construction, of which 11 are along the river. And this is, in its own right, a complex project such that this is the first time where there, other than the bridges, and we haven't really had new bridges as such, where we're actually going to impact the fabric of the actual River Thames. So it's from a, a planning and environmental, it's been an absolute nightmare and, and seven, eight years in the process to get where we are now. The way we're funded, we are the first wastewater only company in the UK, so we actually got a license award on the 24th of August. So although I say we're a project, at the end of the project we do have a responsibility to maintain elements of the actual tunnel, but our prime client is Thames Water who we'll actually be delivering to, and it's actually private investment. So we're not a crossrail high speed two that are financed by the government as such, we're privately financed. Originally, the idea of the risk is a Thames Water project. It was too big for Thames Water, so we came into being. The 4.2 billion, as you can see, is actually split 75% to private investment and 1.1 billion to, uh, from Thames Water itself. And there are interesting ways of how we're getting that money back from that investment, but that's not for today. We have four main work contractors, and as we can see, we've got uh, West, Central and East, and I explained why we've split them those, those ways geographically, and a system integrator, but that system integrator is really looking at our SCADA and MICA systems, because it's really a very simple project. It's a large tunnel with a lot of sort of ventilation going up on top. The complexity comes in actually trying to actually coordinate the building and construction of it. The actual asset itself is relatively simple. From our point of view, we're in a position where we were licensed award last year. We awarded the contracts with our contractors in September, uh, and we are now in the position where we're starting construction this year through to 2023. 
2023 with tunnelling commencing ends and we actually have an obligation that we have a three-year responsibility beyond the construction of the project to maintain that so we are interested in the sort of the asset management and maintenance requirements and then ultimately a lot of it gets handed over to Thames Water itself so some of our technical challenges we talked about it being split into three geographical areas is because if you can see as the actual tunnel is built through London from west to east it goes through three types of geologies and as you can quite clearly see we, we, it was felt necessary to a split the project from a three a four billion into smaller chunks but also to tie into the geographical elements because they're actually procuring their own tbms to actually do the tunneling and it made sense that it actually meant that the management of that project was simple we also have to deal with a lot of existing infrastructure. I said the tunnel itself under the River Thames, would, you'd think it was straightforward, but we are actually having to build brand new shafts near our interceptor outfalls, uh, and, and that actually has an impact. Now, indirectly, it's actually a benefit because we're actually going to be giving back new public space and public realm above those areas uh, to actually give back to the public. But it is a complex project. It also caused lots of problems because where we're actually driving the shafts uh, to actually build the tunnels themselves, they're right in the middle of London and residential, and that's why I said earlier it was a planning nightmare. So our project procurement around BIM is we were very lucky. We were at exactly the right time. So we'll talk about the timeline of BIM. So in, in February 2013 is when 1192 Part 2 came about, and that was the capital delivery. And to give you an idea that in March 2014 is when actually the PAS 3 for operational came into being. Now our project was right at the right time. So our procurement timeline is that we did a contract notice in July after PAS 2 had come out. And we actually went through that tender in January. So it gave us nine months opportunity to really take on board what was in that PAS 2 and build that into our works information and pre-tender requirements. So we were at the op op optimum position to really take advantage early of what we were doing as government level two. So our strategy really was, in alignment to the sort of level two expectations that we talked about this morning, is, is all around information, it's the data, it's the documents, the graphical, non-graphical, that we needed to have that project information through to the asset information lifecycle that level two really is, um, subscribes to, to actually deliver. And we would achieve that through actually focusing on the sort of the gates to actually look at project information model deliverables, which is looking at the drawing information, the CAD information, the, the, the GIS, the COBE, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really a good point to be. So our drivers, we said early on, and we, we came at the right, that we would look to deliver to level two. We're not mandated to deliver to level two, but we felt it was necessary, the large and scale of our project and the sort of the aspirations in line with the government, that it was, it was necessary to actually do that. And, and that was built into uh, the way that we procured the project. We also were committed to an open tool, independent models. It, it, it's key, actually, that we can't, as, and this comes from experience talking to the contractors around what was happening on the Olympics and Crossrail, that open was the way forward. As a client, we needed to be independent, not to actually dictate, but to actually start to look at the fact that an acknowledgement that the contractors out there are mature in what they do, they're good at what they do, they already have tools and people in place. Why disrupt that? And that, that, that's, that's the sort of experience that came about from things like Crossrail and Olympics where the client has decided that it will be a proprietary format, it will be their systems, and then the problems that came about from that were innovating and actually trying to change and actually dealing with improvements. Uh, and also the fact that there was that aspiration that BIM and information management and efficiencies would drive down the potential costs of, of the project throughout the project itself and then on to the operational maintenance. So when we actually engage with our contractors, it was very much that they themselves have applied BIM. So it, they, they, they are mature, they have methods in, in, in place to actually deal with the sort of delivering to level two. They're also better positioned to manage that sort of relationship with their tier twos and tier threes. It's not for us really as the client to get involved in, in what they're actually doing on their day-to-day -day business. Uh, they also, as we talked about, they have a number of tools and mature tools. Uh, we don't really worry what it is, whether they're using Bentley, whether they're using Autodesk. It's really, are they using them to their most efficient purpose? We would also like to retain control, that they would like to retain control over their actual processes, how they actually manage it, how they do their coordination and collaboration, rather than us as a client telling them. And we aren't necessarily going to be experts in, in that field, or we may be 
thinking what it was 10 years ago rather than innovating to the sort of practices that exist now. And we all, but they did ex acknowledge the fact that they wanted us to define the high-level information requirements. So we, we developed our EIRs, and, and, and that requires them to deliver their BIM execution plans. There's no need to go into detail. I mean, we've aligned ourselves to the, the government requirements. But we did want to go for an open model approach. So we, would, we didn't dictate the format, but what we did ask for is that we wanted to go down the IFC route and the COBEs at those data drops, uh, as well as the native files. Now, where we are now is that with IFC as it is being developed and matured, uh, as it is at this point in time, we're actually sharing I models, uh, but our aspiration is to move to full compliant IFC deliverables as part of our gate process, which ties very much in those REBA stages. We're also looking at the asset data dictionary and resource data libraries. Now, we have a client that is Thames Water. They already have a semi-mature set of requirements, and it would be stupid of us to actually try and come up with something completely different when ultimately we're handing that information over to them and we'll be working in collaboration, and we'll quickly talk about that later. We do have an employer's common data environment, but another thing that we, we expect the contractors to create their own environment, how they manage their information. What we have is we've set up our CDEs are very much as a portal for them to actually deliver information to us. And it's really around the managing the exchange review and acceptance of information deliverables, as long as we're our NEC contractual administration requirements, and we're using ASITE Adoddle as that portal, which is uh, actually the same product as the environmental agency are using to deliver theirs. So our BIM deliverables from them really focuses on, on the BIM execution plan, the standards and data exchanges, and, and within our works information, our tender set, we, we created the employer's information requirements, our BIM specification, which we'll go into a bit more detail. So we, rather than go into the detail, as you can see, our EIR, from a commercial perspective, aligns very much with what's on the government site from the task group, but it's our own iteration of it. It was also produced a year and a half ago, so you know it could be improved upon, but I think the feedback that we've had is that it is actually very detailed and very useful. We also, as a good client, because we're not telling the contractors what to do, but we have a client in Thames, we have some high-level requirements, so what we did was we actually looked to deliver what we call the digital production standards, which is a framework based on best practices and industry uh, requirements to look at producing a software agnostic tool set. So what we're doing is we're providing sort of the guidance to say what we would like you to deliver to us and the structure, but we're not actually going to tell the contractors what it is or how they're actually going to deliver it. They do that through their BIM execution plans and then we'll let them get on with it. Uh, and however, we can look at aligning those. As well as that, we've also produced a set of uh, templates and high level resources but because we understand that out there they are using the Autodesk and Bentley, we actually work with an external uh, consultant to, because we, we historically were Bentley experts, but we didn't have necessarily the expertise around Autodesk and Revit. So these high-level resources, we produced three sets to give to our contractors. So it's not that we're actually saying, we want you to do this and then let them get on with it completely. We've been semi-supportive in that we've provided those, those high-level resources to them so they can use that as a framework to then develop from that f further. So some of the enablers that we have to make this work, we talk about collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. We have NEC contracts in place, but what we did was, as part of Tideway, we created this alliance. And this alliance is made up of all of the, uh, our investor, Tideway, our Mainworks contractors, along with Thames Water, really to create a platform and an additional level of encouragement to support that collaboration, to look at innovation. So the area is, is an additional level of sort of pain and gain that really encourages it, because we see that that really is where it falls down, that you can hide behind your contracts. But if we say the contract should just run, what we really need to do is to create an environment where we can empower the business collectively to actually look at how we deliver and how we innovate and take this forward to the point where if three of the contractors all come back with three different ways or methods and we know that one is really good, we can go to the alliance to encourage all of the three to actually take on board those best practices. And that's something that goes beyond the standard commercial NEC contract. We also had this OCI engagement process, this, this 100 day session, where we were engaging with the contractors to look at where what we thought was good two years ago in our design, really where we could improve it and start to build in those efficiencies. So within the sort of the BIM realm, it very much within the design and the information system. So in the design, we were looking at how we could do progressive assurance. 
So the idea is we would actually sit with them looking at how they are developing and how they're doing their design coordination to the point where when they deliver to us at these main gate deliverables, it's, it's not a case that we will be reviewing them from the first time. We're actually interactive with them. We, it's more a cursory. They issue it, we approve it. So we're very much involved in what they're doing, but actually slightly stood away from that. Also, looking at moving away from drawing deliverables, looking at uh, model-based submissions uh, with, rather than the traditional to actually views and how we can actually interact with the tools and the systems that we have to manage that and look at the efficiencies that come with that sort of design management requirements. So some of our challenges, I've talked about the fact that Thames Water is our client. So they go through uh, with all the utilities and offer a five-year planning cycle. So this is a problem with big infrastructure projects that go over a long duration. The next one's due in 2020, so we will be impacted by that. And, and we're working with Thames that they themselves are going through their own BIM journey with 820, and they have a chance every 12 months to influence what we're doing on the project. So there's always that issue of having to deal with our project as well as dealing with the expectation of our client requirements. We are looking to incorporate BIM Level 2 maturity and validation requirements because we are working with the working group. We are a working group partner with, with what Terry was talking about earlier. So we very much, rather than reinvent the wheel, we really should be utilising what we're learning from our government departments and industry to actually make use of what we're developing rather than creating from scratch. It's key, we need to have successful collaboration with our contractors and Thames Water. It, it, you can have everything in place, but if that, that sort of communication fails or falls down, that's where it, becomes it will start to unravel. So we see that as a very key focus uh, to look at. Again, with seven-year projects, retention of people knowledge, we're going to be talking about how we train people and make sure that they're accredited practitioners. But on these long projects, how do we retain that knowledge and people and training? And also to ensure that we maintain, that we actually train and educate and continue to train and educate our own staff as well as overseeing as a good client to ensure our main work contractors are actually going on and actually supporting their staff in that they don't do a cursory training up front and leave them to the wild. It's something that is an investment that they have to actually take on board and, and continue to do it. They can't just train and then let them get on with it. And of course, it's a seven year project, so we're gonna be dealing with hardware and software innovation and issues. I'll say thank you. Now, where we are now is that we, we're just about to get our final BIM execution plans from our contractors, and we're also working with Thames Water and our contractors now to look at our maintenance requirements around the asset cycle. So although it's seven years in the future, we're having to start to plan now with our contractors to ensure what we do throughout the design and construction and then finally the operational and as-built is in alignment as such. But as I said, we're in those early stages. Construction starts uh, this year. Thank you very much.